Hi, I'm Dr. Kelly Starrett. I'm co-founder of The Ready State and San Francisco CrossFit with my wife, Juliette Starrett. Uh, just for some context, San Francisco CrossFit went, had to shutter its doors after 16 years uh, due to the pandemic and uh, a really difficult uh, relationship with our landlord. But I mentioned that in that as we talk and sort of examine uh, injury prevention as it relates to a CrossFit gym today, I just want to give you perspective that I'm coming from a clinician, physical therapist perspective, and as a gym owner, and someone who ran tens of thousands of sessions in our gym. So looking at this through both lenses. The first order of business is sort of to talk about what we mean when we say injury prevention. <clears throat> so without getting into the semantics or arguing uh, about apologetics, really what we are talking about is how do we control what we can control? Someone's gonna step on a barbell, it's clearly impossible to, mid to mitigate or attenuate 100% of injury because fluke accidents and, 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 uh, and trauma happens, comma, it is disingenuous to say that we can't prevent injury or certainly less injury risk. And we like to point out alone that if you just simply look at the data around sleep and its relationship to likelihood of injury, just chronically underrested people are 1.7 times more likely to be injured in sport. And we know CrossFit uh, falls into that sport category. So there is certainly something we can do, and if we have an outlier that disproves the theorem that there's nothing we can control, then lo and behold, there's a lot we can do to, to prevent injury. But I wanna spend a second and actually define or re have a little bit different hot take on what we mean by injury, because I think if I ask people who've gone for a run and their knee hurts, are they injured? They might even answer yes. And conversely, someone who has pain with shoulder, are they injured? No, they're showing up to class. So I think when we look at the research, there, we're not always being very clear, do we have a physical impairment? Is that limiting us in our force generation product, uh, pr force production, or are we truly injured? So an easy way of identifying injury is that when we categorize injury, we can use uh, Syed Nagy's model, the Nagy model of injury, which means that if I'm injured, I can no longer occupy my role in society. I can't occupy my role in my family. I can't do my job. Those are real, can't, can't go to school for lack of, uh, of, of disability. So when we're talking about injury, it's important that we are saying that if someone truly has hit those levels, then <clears throat> that is a medical emergency. So are we discussing that level of problem and how many incidences where we're seeing people in a gym actually injure themselves to the point where they can no longer go to work or occupy their role as a father or a mother or a brother or uh, can't go to school. So clearly when we actually define the term as, as is used by medical schools, as is used by sort of all physical therapy schools, injury is a serious problem. And this tends to fall into the category of, of pathology, right, and categories of a catastrophic injury. And uh, those are the two sort of big buckets for this, right? There's something hot sweat, you know, night sweats, dizziness, fever, vomiting, nausea. And in this role, I just wanna say that our coaches are trained to look for red flags in these positions. And of course, identify clear loss of consciousness, et cetera, et cetera, someone falling off the rig, or you know, we've had people show up at the gym just to talk to a coach who are undergoing cerebral vascular accidents. So our coaches are really adept at identifying people who are inappropriate. And this is one of the places where you wanna make sure that all of our coaches are comfortable in identifying that someone has, is appropriate for training that day. And having them be comfortable with understanding do we have a clear mechanism of injury and trauma or is there something pathological going on here? Let's go ahead and get help and not ask for, for a training session today. But on the other side of that is something we call the incident. And the incident can be loss of force production, that can be loss of biomotor output, that can be loss of wattage, that can be a slower time, lower VO2 output. It could be numbness and tingling, right? It could be paresthesia. It could be even 
um, some pain. So what we end up seeing is that this incident category ends up being a lot of engineering terms, lagging indicators. Something has been going on in environment, lifestyle, health, movement, and all of a sudden someone's showing up in the gym. Again, when we ask most of the people that we work with, either organizations, and I'm talking about from Microsoft to Google to um, Amazon, I've been with all the branches of the government, I've worked with all the military, I've worked with a ton of universities, uh, lots of lots of pro sports across all the fields. When I ask them, how many of you pain-free, very few people actually raise their hands that they're pain-free. So one of the conversations that we're having today about injury mitigation is are we really talking about pain mitigation? Are we talking about if someone is pain-free, are we defining them as injury-free, that they're full to go? Because it turns out that the average person who walks into a CrossFit gym probably has some history of pathology, some history of, of a tweak, a patina of, of uh, injury, a patina of uh, being a, a human. You know, we like to use the example that if I took a picture of your face when you were 16 and took a picture of my 48-year-old face and compared them, you would see degenerative changes on MRI, on radiograph, on pictures. So we know that maybe tissue tolerance isn't quite the same and that we have normal age appropriate changes in our structures that may or may not ever become symptomatic. So I'm trying to not have an intellectual argument about what it is we're talking about, but I want to be clear that this incident level problem is a natural part of the solution and a part of the conversation, and it's disingenuous for us to say that this isn't part of it. We're seeing people reach for NMES devices, we're seeing people reach for percussion, they reach for massage, acupuncture, THC, Ambien, Adderall, whatever they need to do to feel like they can wake up and be appropriate or calm down or self-soothe some of these incident level problems. And so what we're trying to do is change the nature of who owns pain and what is that uh, sort of appropriate intervention level. Now, I believe that CrossFit coaches are some of the best and well-trained and spun up coaches on the planet. Partly that's my experience of the last 16 years, being a part of the original level one staff uh, a long, long time ago and having taught as an SME for CrossFit for almost a decade. And one of the things that we realize is that we want to more closely conjoin the stimulus for adaptation with the diagnostic tool. How can we get people closer to understanding and making sense of what their body's telling them? Now, the problem with this is that this incident level issue means that, is there another place? And are we just waiting around until something hurts or we suck? You know, if you went out and smashed a bunch of pizza and, and drank a bunch of beer with your friends and didn't sleep and you showed up today and your force production was awful and your water was awful and your friend time sucked, then it would be really easy for us to make a, a correlation between environmental behaviors and uh, incident outputs. But what we do know is that some of the few musculoskeletal, uh, one second, um, one of the, some of the few musculoskeletal components that we can manage are incomplete mechanics. So what ends up happening then is that we start to see this relationship as we've developed this by having to coach dumbbells and barbells and uh, challenging our positions under a whole bunch of different uh, considerations that we can identify that oftentimes when people are having a pain-related problem, one of the things that a coach can absolutely do is restore their mechanics. And what's interesting about trauma or catastrophe is rarely do we see this happen in a vacuum, that people have poor movement strategies or that they're working at less effective movement positions uh, and then they have tissues that aren't very healthy because what I'll say is if you have something that's painful and all of a sudden it's not painful, is that a fully healthy, ready to go tissue? And clearly the answer is it depends and more importantly, the, probably the answer is no. Just but the absence of pain does not mean that my athlete is healthy and at full force. So. It's important to understand that when we're trying to say where are the places where we can have inputs on this, then one of the things that we know absolutely is the restoration of position, restoring people's normative ranges, 
uh, giving them full shoulder flexion, full internal rotation of the hip. These kinds of things end up with expressing better biomotor function. We see better output, better wattage, better poundage. We always teach to the highest expression of the movement. This is one of the sort of seminal aspects of being a CrossFit, uh, CrossFitter in a CrossFit community. We have experts in gymnastics and Olympic lifting and powerlifting and running and swimming. And we're able to say, hey, here is what the best expression of that is. Well, it turns out, of course, underneath that is that we have fundamental, foundational and fundamental principles and understanding of how the body is supposed to work. And it turns out that those things map and overlap perfectly. So they closely conjoin where we're starting to see and understand that it's not just about doing pull-ups, it's about loading the shoulder with the arm overhead and being able to create a rotational stability while I pull, right? And what you'll see is that by exposing our athletes to a whole plethora of full range of motion demands, we quickly see that very few people do in fact show up with complete mechanics. What ends up happening then is that we have prioritized over the course of almost two decades a system of exercising that sort of tends to reward intensity and doesn't also simultaneously look at our CrossFit class as a diagnostic tool to see people's incomplete mechanics. Because remember, at some point, there's another way where we can challenge your movement. So hang in there because one of the things that we see is we regularly see that if we can restore someone's position, we can improve their output. If we can return their normative function, oftentimes a lot of these incident level problems go away. And since we are about the sport of position, that's really what CrossFit is, then what we're seeing is that there's a lot of things we can do to make a person more durable by giving them full access instead of saying, hey, arbitrarily, we value hip crease below the knee as our standard then no matter what, we're gonna go hip crease below the knee because a lot of people aren't appropriate for that range of motion. Now, we know that also that your range of motion is, again, this is the view, because I'm a physical therapist and a coach, that range of motion is very much a moving target. That if we see someone, a games athlete at the end of the season, uh, we're, we'll see that if you, our athletes jump on a red eye or have a baby or come through, you know, run a marathon, then simultaneously we'll see those changes in range of motion. That's why we're trying to make every day a diagnostic tool. So let me redefine a few things for you because I think this will help us to, again, understand appropriately what we can control when we are, or what we mean when we say injury prevention. So ultimately what we're talking about is the base of what we're doing is challenging position. And we can say there's two components here. There's movement control, and you might use the term motor control here. And then we have a second one is I'm just gonna say raw biomechanics or tissue. And what I'm asking here is one is that do my athletes understand the movement theory and the technique involved with this, right? Technique is a great surrogate phrase here. And we can argue about should the bar bounce off, where my hand goes, but ultimately all technique is the best expression of how humans move to generate the most force. And that's pretty irrefutable. What we second though is that we can do all of the squat therapy we want, but if it's not a motor control problem or a movement control technique problem, then we have another set of reasons to address. And this set of reasons ends up being that often people do not have normative dorsiflexion or hip range of motion or shoulder extension or shoulder into rotation or can't flex and extend the spine to kip. And so what ends up happening is they develop a language of compensation. So ultimately a good coach is really about a person being able to identify compensation in the movements of the day and limiting that comp compensation, getting the athlete to move to the limits of her ability or their ability. Can we organize them in a way that allows them to attain, sort of, and re retain the principles of CrossFit? Mechanics, consistency, intensity. And But what we're seeing is that we're really good at saying three, two, one, go, turning up the music and letting our athletes work around a problem. And again, that doesn't necessarily predict movement problems. It predicts compensation and loss of force production. So what we can say is that when we're really working towards having an athlete work at a higher level of expression of the physiology, better joint centration, better organization, better midline stability, 
better foot pressure. All of a sudden we see improvements in robustness and, and durability in the system. This has been our experience. When we chase normative ranges, then what we end up seeing is that athletes end up being more durable and more protected. But when we begin to ask the question, why aren't you able to maintain this position, then oftentimes it is first and foremost a technique problem. This is why we say, hey, let's slow you down, tempo, right? Let's pause and make sure you own these positions, isometrics, then we can really make sure that that's not the issue. But when we now get into the second case, we often see that our athletes simply do not have the tissue extensibility to maintain a quality of position. So what we can then start to say is, well, how do we challenge position? Because what I really want to do here is help us to understand that what we're doing in CrossFit is trying to manage and challenge robustness of position. So I can take position, which is really the root of any movement that we do. So every, you know, the difference between a, a deadlift and a squat is simply how upright or bent the torso is, hinged forward the torso is, and what the degree of the knee movement is, knee flexion, and where the barbell is, right, or where the external load is. And so what we end up seeing is that there are very similar patterns to many of the things we do. What's the difference between a downward dog and, and finished position in a handstand? There's not much, the load vector through the shoulder. Why is a snatch different than a, uh, a strict press? Well, it turns out speed and the starting position. So ultimately, when we start to realize what we're in here in CrossFit is a positional, quality management system, we realized that the traditional way of challenging position was with load. And what ends up happening was that that's our, came out of our traditional strength conditioning. Great, you did great there, let's make it heavier. Now what we realized early on in CrossFit was that big strong athletes fell apart under a little cardio respiratory demand. Cardio respiratory demand. And so what ends up happening then is the first time we have you do some jump roping and then come back to that kettlebell swing, things became very interesting. Run, kettlebell swing, pull up as a simple test of skill under cardiovascular demand. Again, our hypothesis is that we are going to challenge the, your ability to maintain the quality of your positions through the, through the training session. So if we don't have benchmarks or bookends of normalcy in our positions, then what we're doing is we're throwing a lot of sort of challenge on top of a person who is already potentially compensating or can express normative ranges given their lack of skill or their lack or missing range of motion. So load, car respiratory man, we do a lot of things that rhyme with 21, 15, 9, which is metabolic demand, right? We know that a little bit of stress can induce a lot of movement error, right? We have uh, this thing called speed. That's why we teach strict press, push press, push jerk, change in direction. This we'll call this closed chain to open chain movements. Suddenly we're an open torque, dumbbells versus kettle uh, versus barbell. And on and on and on, and all, what you suddenly see is that it, Suddenly, even if we're going from a clean to a jerk or a burpee to a box jump, now we've got block practice versus random practice. My point is that we should expect to see breakdowns in our technique with our athletes every day. This is the hallmark of what we, it is we do and why our training is so effective. Because the person who's able to maintain the integrity of their position under so many different variables is really they end up being the person who's the most skilled, most coordinated, and is better able to resist compensation or integration of good positions or lack of good positions in this situation when they compensate. So it's crucial that we begin to ask, hey, not can you move your hands further and further out on the barbell so that you can press, but also, hey, why aren't you able to have normal range of motion? It's like we're coming in and asking people to perform very, very complex formal movement languages without having the basic syntax. Doesn't mean we can't begin to teach first graders how to read, which is exactly what we're doing here, but we need to simplify our systems and we have that. So when we're talking about injury prevention, one of the things that we can absolutely control is the amount of compensation turning the foot out, collapsing the arch, letting the knee come in, loss of midline stabilization. Now we know that those 
compensation strategies do not immediately beget pain or potential injury. We have athletes who get very, very far. The hallmark, I think, of the CrossFit Games has been that we've seen our best athletes become more and more efficient with better expressions of the mechanics. We're seeing feet get a lot straighter, which allows for better hip function and better arch and better foot pressure, right? We've seen that our best athletes, for example, are ruthlessly effective and mechanically moving at the highest expression of the motion and with normative ranges, normative tissue ranges. So what ends up happening is that these athletes are able to achieve this position and then maintain the integrity of that position across these domains and what we end up having is better biomotor output. So once again, it's not just did you get the newbie gains, that means that you were faster, it means that are you moving to the best benefits or the best expressions of what the human can do under these conditions. So as we start to move through here, then we can start to ask, well, what happens then when someone gets tweaked, when someone has pain, still is coming to class is still appropriate, and again, doesn't fall into that category. We may need to slow down, we may need to, to um, lighten loads, we may need to scale, that's totally appropriate, but that's no different than someone coming in without a, a, a skilled movement system, or that's someone coming in after training really hard on the bike and needing to just have a movement practice so that we can support their sport. If we subject an average athlete to a typical CrossFit volume, we'll see that they will no longer be able to actually go out and do their sport because the volume is too high. That was never our intention. Our intention was always to have a strength conditioning GPP practice that could be subjugated or turned into a sports sort of preparation training where we're reteaching skills, having athletes maintain kind of holes in their fitness. But one of the things that we end up being able to sort of manage better is that when we are moving towards athletes moving in these directions, we can often say, well, we'll write right on the board, we'll break it down into sort of five categories. So for us, we're saying, hey, is this a joint restriction problem as a physical therapist? Is this a sliding surface myofascial problem? Is this a muscle stiffness motor control problem? Or is this a movement problem? Again, that's technique. So we have biomechanics and then we have technique. But what we do know is that this environmental component ends up being probably sort of the lion's share of issues. So if we're going to say, hey, we really do want to batten down this incident level problems, not the injuries. We see very few true injuries. Brooke Wells is an example of a true injury. Her, she had an incident level problem in her elbow for months and months and months until she had a traumatic dislocation, that's an injury. But she was operating to the best of her abilities on that side. But what ends up happening here is that if we start to look at issues of environment, environment, then we can and do have some significant uh, aspects here where we can control sleep, change in volume, training volume, change in training density, right? We have nutrition and hydration. All of these end up being components of tissue health, tissue robustness for the viscoelastic properties of the tissue, but we know that this training volume change, density volume change ends up being a very, very strong indicator, plus issues of sleep. So if we're working on trying to mitigate, well, it turns out that this biopsychosocial model of looking at the health and robustness of the person sort of does make sense here, right? Because it turns out if a person doesn't sleep, we don't have sort of consistent volume, consistent intensity, we're not looking at hydration, nutrition, we're not managing aspects of warm up and appropriate adaptation response to the exercise, i.e. I smash myself and then sit at my desk, that is a poor expression of what's possible with the human or what, what best practice is, we see that there's a ton in the environment that we can manage. CrossFit has been about nutrition, we've talked about hydration, we talk about consistency and intensity, that's what these two languages are. We're starting to be able to track sleep and be able to have those conversations. 
early on, what we needed to do is say, hey, let me, let's warm up and start to play. How do you feel? What's going on? The subjective measurements of readiness are very, very powerful. And being able to quickly take weight off the bar or manage load or manage intensity is a really good way to manage this training, delta in training volume and training density. These two things are going to require a more sophisticated coach, and that's possible. But if we're talking about the true aspects of injury mitigation in our gym, a lot of these things happen behind the curtain, right? The coach can handle these two aspects, but nutrition, hydration, sleep, <clears throat> safety, uh, you know, again, those things we're gonna have to pull back in. So I'm advocating for the expansion of the role of the coach to be able to look and talk about the other aspects of the 23 hours of the day. Right, if our typical CrossFit athlete is coming to us somewhere between three and five times a week, then we have a lot of time to be able to sort of have these conversations built in, still have a movement practice, still have a monostructural practice. <clears throat> but until we manage these things, plus manage robustness of position, and be able to identify what that missing aspect of, is. again, compensation, compensation, and I can put the, when we see expressions of poor adaptation response to these things, plus poor positional capacity, then we really be able to need to be able to jump in and shut that down. Say, hey, I see that you are now rounding your back when you deadlift that may or may not ever cause a problem, we know that it's a poor expression of technique. It doesn't translate very well to a lot of other movements. We have seen, I don't know, in my gym in 16 years, 20,000 rounded back deadlifts, very few, if any, ever related to a herniated disc on the spot where someone, you know, spine blew out their back, but we know over time <clears throat> that ends up being a less effective position. We see over time that those skills don't translate more effectively. So when we're trying to say, what is it we can control? Well, we already have a pretty robust movement program built into the tenets of CrossFit. We're going to touch all of the seminal positions that the body requires, that the shoulder extension, shoulder interpretation, shoulder flexion, right, end range flexion, all of those things are gonna be exposed in the language. Now we will need to deconstruct a second further and say, hey, do we have the root building blocks to be able to express that? And if we put people through a movement assessment, <clears throat> which we do every day with our movement choices, then we absolutely have the opportunity to say, hey, we can put position back into the lexicon of the coach and the athlete, not just did I go faster today, that must have been fine. Again, on the bike, it probably matters less. Uh, with complicated movement skills, it matters more. How can we let our athletes make errors and give them a chance to correct it before a coach intervenes or an athlete knows they need to shut themselves down? So as we, again, try to peel this off, I want to leave you with the idea that there is a ton we can do to create a robust person who is more injury proof, right? We, there's a lot we can do here to make sure that the person is feeling much better and is less sensitized or less sort of uh, likelihood of them being sensitized to simple myofascial problems. Do they feel safe? Are they sleeping, right? Are they well hydrated? All of those things lead to a, a position where we can feel better and are less likely to have those incident related problems. But as we're tangling or trying to untangle this Gordian knot, let's not make it some black box where we're unclear that we have less agency than we do. We have a massive amount of agency so that people can not only train with us, but they can actually have a moment to resolve their lingering movement dysfunctions, lingering holes in their cardiometabolic systems, movement systems, energy systems, movement pathways, energy pathways, movement pathways, and we actually put them back out into uh, the wild in a better situation. I'm Dr. Kelly Starrett. Uh, I'm kelly at thereadystate.com for follow-ups. Thank you very much.